Welcome, everybody, um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's absolutely fantastic to see such a great turnout, particularly since uh, we had um, not provided a whole heap of notice on this webinar. So we're so delighted that it's um, uh, there's enough interest in EPAs and environmental governance out there to um, really um, draw a great crowd and uh, a panel that we're really excited about. Um, so I'm Revel Poynton, I'm the Managing Lawyer of the Southern and Central Queensland EDO team, um, part of our Healthy Environment and Justice stream of work. And we're absolutely delighted to be presenting this webinar this evening um, to launch EDO's new report, Implementing Effective Independent EPAs in Australia, and um, a Queensland specific report of the same uh, nature, which will actually be released tomorrow. Um, and to also to be enjoying a, I'm sure, um, uh, enthralling discussion with our eminent expert panel members who will be sharing their learnings and thoughts on what makes an effective EPA, what makes for effective environmental governance um, more broadly. And I'll be introducing uh, our panel in a moment. Um, but of course, let's stop first to recognise that um, each of us across this country are on land that has been stolen, um, that their sovereignty was never ceded, and that land was taken and continues to be taken violently and unjustly with little to no recognition of the traditional custodians who have lived in harmony with this country for many thousands of years. Let's also remember that environmental governance, as we're discussing this evening, has actually been and continues to be the source of a lot of dispossession and harm to First Nations since colonization I'm joining you from the land of the Turbal and Jagra peoples in Mianjin this evening, uh, and I extend my respects to their elders past and present, and to First Nations around this country and on the call today. I'd like to share also that EDO are striving to be an active part of the work towards reconciliation and healing of the damage done since colonisation to First Nations and this country. So, um, why are we talking about EPAs at all? Uh, we're here this evening to discuss how we can ensure environmental governance in Australia at all levels is undertaken with integrity and effectiveness in providing for First Nations justice, environmental justice, and the protection of community health and our rich and diverse environments. So the reports uh, we're launching tonight, which the fabulous Molly O'Connor will be um, presenting in a moment, we're inspired by a lot of discussion across Australia on the importance and role of EPAs and how environmental governance can be improved. Most people are familiar with the call at a national level for an independent EPA, which was most recently discussed around Graham Samuel's independent review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, our federal environment laws. And we continue to watch to see whether the um, excellent recommendations from that report, including an improving self-determination of First Nations, will actually be implemented, um, or whether we will only see a further erosion of our environmental laws and governance, which in some ways is threatened from what we've seen since that review. The Tasmanian government has also recently undertaken to legislate to make its EPA statutorily independent. And the Queensland government has committed at the last election to this term investigating the implementation of an EPA in the state, which is the only state without an EPA across the country. Um, consultation for this investigation has commenced with submissions in Queensland open until 6th of February for this round. Uh, we understand there may be broader consultation later, but um, we do encourage Queenslanders to get your views heard uh, during this consultation before 6th of February, so that um, you can be sure to get your opinion in on this important topic. And our Queensland specific report that'll be out tomorrow um, can assist with that consultation, but it is um, in line with the same recommendations of our national report, which is now out. So for tonight's agenda, uh, we will first up here from the lead author of um, our new report, Molly O'Connor. Um, who will be providing a summary of the EDO's nine key recommendations uh, for what does it take to have an effective EPA uh, at a national or state level. Um, then, when the, then we will dive into some questions with our um, experts 
Um, and we have some set questions that we're going to go through at the start, and we ask uh, that any questions that uh, you think of um, in the audience as you go along, you just pop them into the chat box. And um, once we have finished our discussion, we, um, we will pull out some of the questions from there as, as time allows. So without further delay, I will introduce the lead author of EDO's new report, Molly O'Connor. Molly is a proud Kondamooka woman from beautiful Minjeriba, or North Stradbroke Island. She's committed to protecting the land for her people and uh, for future generations. She's also a solicitor in the Southern and Central Queensland team at EDO, which is part of the Healthy Environment and Justice uh, stream of work um, of EDO. And I'm very, um, very glad to work with Molly. She's a fantastic solicitor, and uh, I'm sure you'll see the quality of her work when you read, um, hopefully, our reports. So take it away, Molly. Thank you so much for that introduction, Rebel, and just checking everyone can hear me. I think that it's all good. So yes, as Rebel mentioned, EDO is very excited and pleased to launch our newest report, Implementing Effective Independent Environmental Protection Agencies in Australia, Best Practice Environmental Governance for Environmental Justice. The report has been a mammoth effort and we couldn't have done it without the assistance of a number of EDO solicitors, uh, and I'm particularly going to uh, say thanks to Nicole Sommer, Rachel Walmsley and Flo Ramsey, as well as numerous EDO volunteers who dedicate their time to help us each week. So in our report, we make nine key recommendations for how EPAs in Australia can be implemented and reformed to better protect the environment and human health. And um, with a particular focus on achieving environmental justice and First Nations justice. So I'm going to explore these recommendations for you briefly now. So starting with our first recommendation, um, which relates to achieving justice for First Nations in Australia. Having our first recommendation relate to First Nations was essential for us at EDO, as due to the continuing effects of colonisation and dispossession, First Nations in Australia are often structurally disadvantaged. This means that environmental harms, such as pollution, degradation, and the impacts of climate change are often disproportionately felt by First Nations in Australia. For example, many remote First Nations communities are impacted by polluting industries that are located on their lands, such as asbestos mining at Bayulgil on the land of the Bundjalung people in Northern New South Wales, lead poisoning in Mount Isa, which has a large First Nations community here in Queensland, and nuclear dump sites on the land of the Bungala people in South Australia. Because of this, we believe that EPAs and really any government department and organization working with First Nations should have a duty to develop and act in accordance with cultural protocols that are both based on First Nations law. Cultural protocols are accepted standards and procedures for all dealings between organizations, such as an EPA and First Nations. And they are essential to ensuring that respectful and meaningful partnerships and relationships are developed with First Nations communities and individuals. Cultural protocols must be developed through extensive consultation and co-design with First Nations and must be based on First Nations law, which refers to the learning and transmission of customs, traditions, kinship, and heritage of First Nations. This will require direct consultation with First Nations communities in all aspects of environmental regulation, which must be done in a way that recognizes the self-determination of First Nations peoples, and which is based on and provides for free, prior, and informed consent. Moving on to our second recommendation, um, which relates to environmental justice frameworks. We recommend that EPAs must develop these environmental justice frameworks to ensure that disproportionate environmental burdens are not imposed on communities and individuals that face structural disadvantage on the basis of race or color, ethnicity, nationality, age, gender identity, disability, or income. Environmental justice frameworks are also essential to ensure that these groups are involved in environmental decision-making that impacts them. So what is environmental justice? 
um, it's been defined by the United States EPA as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income, with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies. The need for environmental justice in Australia in Australian environmental regulation can be seen in many examples. One example can be seen in the suburbs in Western Sydney, which have become heat islands due to a deadly combination of rising global average temperatures caused by climate change, as well as poor development choices, such as dense buildings, a lack of tree coverage and large expanses of black asphalt. Extreme heat particularly endangers children, elderly people, and people with disability and existing health conditions. On the 4th of January in 2020, the suburb of Penrith in Western Sydney was the hottest place on earth at a whopping 48.9 degrees Celsius. This is compared to more affluent suburbs in Sydney's east, such as Mossman, which has high vegetation co coverage compared to the Western suburbs, which lowers average temperatures and potential adverse health impacts. Those living in lower socioeconomic or more diverse locations should not face lower health and environmental income outcomes than those in higher socioeconomic locations. This shows the necessity of environmental justice so that environmental regulation and decision-making equally benefits all people, regardless of race, color, ethnicity, nationality, age, gender, identity, disability, or income. Moving on to our third recommendation, um, which provides that EPAs must have clearly defined roles and duties so that they can fulfill their objectives and purpose. While EPAs in Australia have traditionally been focused on regulating pollution, we are recommending that EPAs should have broader objectives and duties to bring a more informed, holistic approach to environmental regulation across the board. This includes the need for a duty to achieve environmental justice so that EPAs are addressing the ways in which the impacts of their decisions and activities are disproportionately felt by minority and low income groups. EPA should also have a duty to act consistently with the right to a healthy environment, which has been recognized at the international level by the United Nations Human Rights Council. EPAs must also have a duty to implement legislation in accordance with principles of ecologically sustainable development, which is already a nationally and internationally recognized concept. And finally, EPAs should have a duty to take action to reduce the risks of climate change, particularly given climate change will disproportionately impact those who have contributed the least to its causes. Our fourth recommendation relates to establishing EPAs as independent statutory authorities that are free from ministerial influence and which have an independent governance structure. We recommend that EPAs should be established with a board of at least four members that is responsible for providing strategic oversight, guidance and policy. Board members should bring a diversity of perspectives, including First Nations representation, and should be supported by a number of other advisory groups, including a chief environmental scientist, an environmental justice group, and an environmental health group. EPAs should be independent and free from ministerial control, as well as free from industry capture. An EPA should also not be overridden by other agencies, such as the coordinator general in the Queensland context. For example, in Queensland, the Department of Environment and Science advised the coordinator general that a draft environmental impact statement for the Olive Downs coal mine provided insufficient detail to properly assess the impacts to the environment of leaving final voids in the floodplain. In spite of this advice, the coordinator general reportedly did not request the further information that the department stated was necessary to properly assess the environmental risks of the project and instead mandated conditions for the project which provided for the final voids to be left in the floodplain. This case study demonstrates the importance of establishing an environmental regulator that is able to conduct independent environmental impact assessment of major projects, free from the unfettered involvement and decisions of other agencies. 
Our fifth recommendation is that EPAs should have accountability mechanisms to ensure that they properly undertake their functions and duties and are held to account if they do not. This requires well-defined decision-making criteria to which the EPA can be held to account, as well as strong review mechanisms. Judicial review and merits review should be available for environmental decision-making with open standing and public interest cost provisions so that review can be sought in the public interest. There should also be regular and transparent scrutiny of the performance of EPAs, such as through an environmental auditor to ensure that EPAs are fulfilling their functions. Our seventh recommendation relates to decision-making by EPAs um, and the fact that they should be transparent through public disclosure of environmental information and data, as well as proactive community engagement and the ability to make submissions. Transparency of environmental information is a fundamental element of good governance that assists in ensuring decisions are made in the public interest and in ensuring that the public are empowered to be aware of environmental impacts and to utilize their rights to protect their health and the environment. Our seventh recommendation is that EPAs should have sufficient powers to fulfill their roles. Of particular importance is proactive environmental monitoring and reporting on the state of the environment and environmental values, which should be publicly available so that members of the public can be made aware of the state of the environment and so that proactive action can be taken to address environmental issues. EPAs should be responsible for setting clear, legally enforceable environmental standards, which is essential given that environmental standards in many jurisdictions are currently only guidelines and often cannot be used to hold polluters to account. EPAs also need substantive decision-making powers in the regulation of proposed and existing development activities in order to be able to comprehensively protect the environment and human health. The EPA should be the overarching environmental regulator and should not be able to be overridden by other agencies or ministers. Our eighth recommendation relates to the funding of EPAs. EPAs need adequate funding to fulfill their functions, and many EPAs in Australia have had limited funding due to inadequate budget allocation to the environment by the government. However, securing funding for an independent statute authority without reliance on some form of budget allocation can be difficult, particularly if funding is otherwise sourced through penalties, levies, or fees. A polluter pays model can be a way to source funding that is not reliant on budget allocations. However, in our recommendation, a mix of funding sources is preferable to ensure that there is more stability of funding and so that environmental regulation is valued in government budget allocations. Budget allocations should therefore still be a source of funding for EPAs mixed in with the polluter pays model. Our ninth and final recommendation is that EPAs should be supported by relevant expertise. Of particular importance is that EPAs must recognize value and implement the knowledge and experiences of First Nations peoples. This may be achieved through the development of cultural protocols, as well as through identified positions on the board or other advisory bodies such as an environmental justice group. There should also be the recruitment and retention of First Nations staff within EPAs, so that First Nations knowledge and views are incorporated into the mechanisms and workings of an EPA. EPA board members should also bring a diversity of experiences and perspectives and have the necessary expertise to ensure that the EPA is a respected science-driven regulator. So in conclusion, these nine key recommendations are, in the EDO's opinion, the minimum requirements for strong environmental governance. If Australia is to protect the environment and human health for future generations, then reform of existing or new EPAs to improve environmental governance is required throughout the nation. Thank you for listening to my overview of our national report, and we hope you take the time to read the report for yourselves. Um, and we're happy to share a link to it in the chat if you are interested in reading it. Um, and as mentioned by Revel, we will also tomorrow be publishing our Queensland report specific um, to the Queensland government's current investigation of the need for an independent EPA in Queensland. And we really encourage all Queenslanders to have a say 
um, and you can access the community consultation questionnaire through the QR code on the screen or through the link. Um, I will now pass back to Revel to start off our panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly, for that excellent summary. As you can see, we at EDO have great hopes for environmental governance uh, going forward. Um, I'll now actually stop the recording. I've realised I can do that. <laughs> so um, thanks for joining us, uh, those watching at home, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation.